Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, next, I'd like to invite to the podium my um, co-principal investigator, uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Brian Daniels, Director of Research and Programs at the Penn Cultural Heritage Center of the University of Pennsylvania Museum to provide us some closing thoughts, and then I'll be back. Thank you, Corey. Um, I've been asked to offer some concluding thoughts about our symposium as a way to summarize the ideas that we've all been discussing over the past three days. Many of you know that I work with several of our speakers, Corey Wegner, Salam al Kantar, Catherine Hansen, Jesse Johnson, Aparna Tandon, in emergency responses for our colleagues in Syria and Iraq. But over the course of this conference, I have found myself thinking about Oregon half a world away from the Middle East, and about a man named Bud Smith. Bud is a Native American, and he's 103 years old. Knowing that he had reached an extraordinary age, his family recently asked if I would record an oral history with him. When we sat down together this August, Bud had one thing on his mind. He wanted to talk about the 1964 Christmas flood along the Kalamath River a thousand year event during which high water crested 55 feet above the river's banks. It is an event of the living memory of many in Northern California and Southern Oregon, still remarked upon and commemorated in places with signs and plaques that mark how high the water rose. As might be expected, it was a noteworthy experience in Bud's long life. But the disaster that Bud wanted to talk about was not the flood itself, but what happened afterward to Bud the disaster was the response. In the wake of the flood, the Army Corps of Engineers undertook a program to channel the Klamath River, dredging not only debris from the flood, but the irregular rock-strewn banks that had formed over millennia of glacial deposition. The consequence was that the natural spawning grounds for fish, and especially for salmon, were also dredged away. In the years that followed, the number of salmon running up the river to spawn dropped precipitously, and two de deleterious consequences followed. First, because many native people in the Klamath River Basin rely upon fishing for their protein, fewer salmon meant the loss of a regular and free food source. Although other protein could be purchased at local markets, the cost was prohibitive, and as a result, there was generally less disposable family income following the dredging. Second, because salmon feature prominently in the Native American religious cycle of world renewal along the Klamath River, and because fewer salmon were running up the river, it seemed to traditional religious practitioners that their culture was now experiencing an existential threat. What happened on the Klamath River is a reminder that a disaster in and of itself is not a self-evident fact or inevitable result but a social construction involving the intersection of manifold hazards as well as human action and inaction. This situation is hardly unique. Earthquakes in Chile go unremarked while earthquakes in Haiti, China, or Nepal result in widespread human tragedy. Political choices and funding limitations structure what response is possible in Syria and Ukraine. Terry Cannon rightly reminds us that disasters do not come from nowhere. They are the consequence of an external social, economic, and political logic that is always present, but becomes heightened in that moment of crisis. Even more, the organizational culture in a country can limit the range of the possible. Ignoring earthquake risk results in needless death in Nepal. A hollowed out civil society in Syria compounds the effects of civil war. Indifferent museum leaders in Ukraine replicate structures of cultural and ideological oppression. As much as organizational cultures may contribute to a disaster, our discussions have also shown that certain organizational dynamics are even more crucial to the success of emergency responses. Here, Debbie Ford has encouraged us to theorize in more, in more nuanced ways the forms of organizational communication and strategies involved in our practices and in our interventions. We are dealing, in her words, with a wicked problem a problem that has no clear or correct answer, but one that requires keeping focus on mission and on outcome. 
There is a theoretical literature here and much additional work to be done. Our field is primed to make a real intellectual contribution. Already, we have seen that it is only possible to protect heritage by considering the cultural context of the disaster. Successful responses require taking seriously, as Kyung Zhang put it, considering local communities as the authors of their own disaster recovery. Local knowledge tells us about how people want to flourish and how they want to live. If we are to build heritage back better, it cannot be done without culture. While this point is indeed worth making, as Richard Leventhal said just a few moments ago, it is truly remarkable that we still must make the case that heritage matters. Shifting perspectives only underscores how odd this situation is. In looking at the same issue through a human rights lens, Susan Wolfenbarger forcefully reminded us that the stakeholders in cultural heritage response are people who are rights holders. Lest we forget, we have legal duties and ethical responsibilities to them that we ought to take very seriously. This is not to say that building up an organizational capacity for response is easy or has a ready-made recipe. Indeed, a reoccurring theme throughout all of the presentations over the past three days is that protecting cultural heritage during and after an emergency involves overcoming almost Herculean odds in access, in physical security, in logistics, in bureaucracy, and in political inertia. It is a credit to all the presenters in this room and to all those who have undertaken these responses that any intervention has worked at all. I have very much appreciated the frank discussion, perhaps the admission, that the Haiti Recovery Project's organizational challenges were significant. And as much as the project resulted in such incredibly positive outcomes, it also exacted a personal toll. Richard Kieran reminded us just how hard it was to get the project structurally off the ground in the first place. Stephanie Hornbeck demonstrated to us the gap between the ideal and what was possible, and also what can be accomplished by acting as a dedicated cultural steward. Evie Oler illustrated the very basic problem of a finding appropriate working space and contracting for it in the federal system. And Rosemary Fallon revealed how challenging implementing a simple training could be. There is an immediacy to these experiences that rings very true when safeguarding heritage in the humanitarian space and in dealing with large-scale bureaucracies. And as humanitarian response has shifted from a model of emergency mitigation to increasing local capacities, the role of leadership in the response process has come to the fore. Key Lu called on us to consider the infrastructure of leadership and to examine ways that we could empower and train local leaders to identify risks, to manage them, and to increase the effectiveness of overall response. Our cases showed quite poignantly what the stakes are in meeting Kilu's appeal. We saw in Syria through Salam al-Kuntar's discussion that local leadership is driving emergency response with a minimal amount of international support. Indeed, protecting cultural heritage has cost local Syrian leaders their lives. In Ukraine, Igor Pashivalio argued that curatorial leadership was critical not only to the protection of Ukrainian heritage, but also to making museum spaces responsive to the political challenges surrounding them. For Nepal, Kamal Arayal showed us how quick and decisive leadership resulted in the protection of monumental religious sites. And similarly, Olson John Julian attributed the success of the Haiti Recovery Project to resolute precision and purpose flexibility in implementation, and creativity in response. Together, these cases showed us the benefits of keeping, in Debbie Ford's terms, a mission focus. But there is another lesson in our case studies. We are not alone. There are actors in other sectors that do risk assessments, surge response, and post-disaster needs assessments well. Aparna Tandon pointed out that our partnerships in this field are ready and waiting and that we can join with humanitarian teams. Not only can we learn from them, but the structure of what works in the humanitarian space merits further scholarly attention, particularly as it pertains to cultural heritage protection. 
The work of the Alliance for Response by Lori Foley pointed to the value of organizational partnerships that cross emergency response sectors and the importance of replicating these networks when protecting heritage at a regional and national scale. Diana and Dai flagged for us that these networks are just as important for protecting ideas, beliefs, and intangible practices. But what happens when that organizational infrastructure doesn't exist or has atrophied? The answer in Haiti was to build much of it from the ground up following the earthquake. In Iraq, it has been to train and update the competencies of heritage professionals in the country. Jessie Johnson's commitment, shown by her paper and in her work, has figured in the successful creation of a new cohort of Iraqi conservators. In Afghanistan, Fahim Rahimi outlined the dedica dedication and perseverance of Afghans who have repeatedly reconstructed their National Museum's collection. Put simply, with all the vicissitudes of success and periodic failure, this is what resilience looks like. So where do we go from here? There has been much discussion about the collection of baseline data about cultural heritage. There are many reasons to do so, to identify specific heritage assets, to meet legal requirements, and to have information at hand in that moment of crisis. Deidre McCarthy illustrated the potential of what happens when technologies are linked, government partnerships are forged at multiple levels, and survey can be done at scale. The standards and results from her, we, her work are a model for, to be commended. But right now, domestically and internationally, we simply do not know what all the cultural resources are, nor where they are. We do not know all the attributes that make heritage significant to a local community. We do not even have a comprehensive systematic research design in place to collect information about instances of heritage destruction. Moreover, there are other ways to think about this problem. As Katherine Hansen observed, perhaps we should be thinking in terms of attributes of resilience rather than in terms of what heritage might be lost. What we can say right now is that successful cases of protecting cultural heritage during complex emergencies have involved four key factors, strategic partnerships, committed champions, effective communication, and a community-centered orientation. Framing our knowledge in these categories gets us further in understanding what attributes permit emergency heritage interventions to result in positive outcomes. Yet we should still be dissatisfied. We should want to understand the nuances of organizational dynamics, theories of leadership under stress, forms of operational communicative rationality, and the field of cultural production through which communities produce and remake their heritage. Exploring these topics as research demands additional scholarship, intellectual creativity, and as Carrie Fritz made clear, a distributed network of researchers working on common problems nationally and internationally. Only then, once we have started our research, identified our cases, and created our social scientific models, will we be able to address that grand challenge that Secretary David Scorton asked us to meet, and the reason why we are all gathered right now, to figure out how, in a far more systematic and thoughtful way, to save the irreplaceable objects that connect us all to culture and history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, for kind of wrapping all of the ideas for presenters over what was a pretty long conference, but very successfully pulling it all together for us to think about in our next steps. So um, just uh, before I forget again, I wanted to thank uh, my colleague Jesse Johnson and her discussant Kim Rice for speeding like the speed of light through her presentation. This is why I love working with Jesse, because if you ask Jesse, oh, I have you know, 50 military people coming next week, can you please provide a day of training for them on conservation? Sure, Corey, I can do that. Can you do a 20 minute presentation in 10 minutes? Yes, Corey, I can do that. She never, you know, it's yes and, I'm on to the next thing. So thank you so much um, for ceding some of your time. 
Um, I also want to mention, um, and I don't have a slide for this, but let me just tell you, you heard a little bit, um, some of our presenters today, uh, Fahim, Ihor, and I hope a lot of people who are watching us on the web today, on the webcast, are um, participants in our past first aid to cultural heritage in times of crisis course that was developed, um, the brainchild of Aparna Tandon, who's with us here, and Ikram. And um, I've been lucky enough to be a part of that process over since 2010. And I wanted to um, remind people, I think it came up a couple of times, but the first aid for, uh, to cultural heritage in times of crisis course will be offered here in Washington, D.C., hosted by the Smithsonian Institution. And um, I know many partners around, in and around the Washington, D.C. area who are going to help us with that. It will be May 23rd through June 24th, yes, nearly a, an entire month of courses. Um, and the call for participants to apply has gone out on the ECROM website, which is uh, ecrum.org, and on, I think it's on our unite to saveesiedu website as well. So if you know someone who would be interested in applying to participate in that course, please look it up, and there'll be more information coming out about that soon. Um, and then if you'll bear with me just a little bit longer, um, so you know next steps will be that our presenters will edit and revise the papers that they provided for today, and we are aiming for a publication early next year. Um, I also want to give a lot of thanks because that nothing like this happens without a whole team of people, a huge team of people. First, uh, I want to thank and acknowledge my amazingly supportive husband, Paul, <laughs> who's here in the audience. Stand up, Paul, please. Really quick, just really quick. So because of him, I was able to you know, move here, take this job, and uh, he sometimes doesn't see me for uh, long hours at a time, days at a time. So thanks, Paul. Um, and then um, I'd like to thank all of our amazing speakers today, many of whom left their time zones and their comfort zones, and so we appreciate that. Um, to the National Museum of American History and Director John Gray for hosting us here in the Warner Brothers Auditorium. Of course, we always have to thank those who make these, these kinds of events possible. So thanks to the John and Carolyn Peterson Family Fund via the Smithsonian Grand Challenges Consortia and the whole consortia office, M M Michelle Delaney, um, Liz, everybody who has helped us from that office, Maggie, thank you so much. Um, and also to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their support. Uh, that they've given us over the past uh, year and um, more to come. Um, thanks to my co-PIs on the Unite to Save World Cultures Consortia project, and I'm just gonna say them really quickly. If you're here, please stand up. Rosemary Fallon, Doug Hall, Jessica Johnson, Amy Marino, Michael Mason, Evie Oler, Aviva Rosenthal, Sarah Stouderman, Bill Tompkins, Brian Daniels, just was standing here, Lori Foley, Stephanie Hornbeck, Aparna Tandon, and Susan Wolfenbarger. So thanks to all of you. Many months, many months in the planning. Thanks to my amazing staff members who put in a lot of long hours and starting with Teresa Sims because Teresa has been with me through everything. starting with the level one consortia grant that we did a year ago and leading up to this moment, everything from writing the proposals to um, getting all of you here in these seats. Teresa was a huge leader in that. Stacy Bow, who came to us fairly recently and is working with us on the first aid course. Yay, Stacey. Um, and some people who probably aren't sitting here because they're busily doing other things at the Smithsonian, but Amy Adams and Jeffrey Cavanaugh in the Undersecretary's office who helped support all of the administrative things that made this happen. And our wonderful interns, Marie Cruz Gutierrez Villa, Stephanie Klein, Grace Golden, and many of our just in time interns who came to help us just this week. So thank you very much. 
Um, and Amanda Long. Sorry, Amanda, you're out there too. You were one of our kind of just in time people to help us with all of our Twittering and tweeting. And um, finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Richard Curran, even though he's already gone, um, for his continued faith in the idea that we can, in fact, unite to save world cultures. And I just want to invite all of you to join us in that mission. Thank you.